what stupid thing did Charles do to cause his arrest or make him go into hiding? Ed, Charlie is not a stupid man. He well, he wasn't hurt. too smart. I can tell you, getting in such a mess that I have to fly 16 hours in order to... Sometimes I honestly think that that boy isn't capable of doing anything. Except, of course, give idealistic speeches and write novels that'll never be published. Unless the entire disappearing act is to stunt you, to publicize his forthcoming autobiography. Well, why don't you just go home? I'll find my husband by myself. Beth, I'll be ready in a few minutes. Take your time. I still want an answer to that question. An emotional confrontation between Jack Lemmon and Sissy Spacek in Missing, the controversial new film about alleged United States involvement in South American politics. That's one of four new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Sneak Previews. And across the aisle from me is Gene Sisko, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. And this is Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. Now, in addition to Missing, we'll also be reviewing an exceptional dramatic film about religious cults called Ticket to Heaven. Also, a documentary called Vernon, Florida, about a Florida retirement town. But first, Roger begins with TV star Morgan Fairchild's first movie, a thriller called The Seduction. Well, The Seduction is an exploitation film with a slick surface and a sleazy underside. Mm -hmm a moronic variation on the old theme that a beautiful woman is even more attractive in the movies if she screams a lot. The Seduction stars Morgan Fairchild of TV's Flamingo Road as a Los Angeles television anchor who becomes an absolute obsession in the life of a young pervert played by Andrew Stevens. He follows her around, he makes anonymous phone calls, he buys her flowers and candy, he spies on her, and in this scene he breaks into her apartment and terrorizes her while, she's, while he's taking her picture. Jamie. What are you doing? Please, Derek. Jamie, I just want to take your picture. I don't want you to take my picture. I want you to get out of my house. Now, I mean it. Stop it. Your eyes are so exciting. Look, I am not kidding around. Would you get out of here? That's your pretty when you look at me that way. Derek, stop it. Get out. Good expression. Get out of here. Leave me alone. Come on, wet your lips. Damn you. Get away. Come on, let's stop, stop it. The end of that scene is especially ridiculous. Michael Sarazen bursts in there, rips the camera away with one hand, throws it away, flattens Andrew Stevens with a right cross to the jaw. He looks like John Wayne, but then he lets the guy go away. That's nothing. Later in the film, a policeman says, well, we'd like to arrest him, but he hasn't done anything wrong. That's for sure. If they arrested this guy, the movie would be over. Right. <laughs> the whole movie is just that ridiculous. The filmmakers have avoided any temptation to provide personalities for these characters. The people in this movie are simply walking, talking Southern California lifestyles. They spend more time in the movie drying their hair and watering their plants than they do with each other, and it gets to be really boring the way that Andrew Stevens can so easily always invade Morgan Fairchild's privacy. In this scene, he even infiltrates her TV news teleprompter. Good evening, I'm Jamie Douglas, and this is the 6 o'clock news. In the news tonight is the report of another jet airliner hijacked to Cuba. Also standing by with a live minicam report is KXLA reporter John Leakley at the side of a West Side supermarket where a gunman is holding at least three people hostage. And later in tonight's news, I'll have the first in a series of special reports on the sweetheart killer case that has been plaguing Los Angeles for the past three months. Jamie, I'm watching you... Enough is enough. Morgan Fairchild is mad as hell, and she isn't going to take it anymore. Jamie. Jamie, I'm here.
You know, the moral premise of this film is about as deep as I spit on your grave. It's okay for a guy to chase a woman for two hours. If at the end of the film the woman shoots at the guy, then that makes it a feminist film, right? <laughs> the Seduction is a dumb, sleazy film that exists primarily to exploit Morgan Fairchild's undeniable sure. beauty and TV fame. Sure. Some critics think maybe the movie is a sly, satirical attack on the superficial lives of the beautiful people in California. Well, I don't think so. I think it's primarily a film about the violation of a woman's privacy, and that's creepy. A very good American movie has been made on the same subject, Taxi Driver, about Robert De Niro's obsession with Sybil Shepherd. but now, well, I guess you could say a very bad movie has been made on the same subject. I think it's a very bad movie, too. Um, I think you're absolutely right. They choose not to give this uh, creature she plays any personality mm -hmm. at all. I think the reason is that this woman, based on this film at least, haven't seen her on her TV show, mm -hmm. I don't think she can act. I think she's a, literally a mannequin in a, in a uh, dime store. I mean, it's, it's absurd. Uh, the other thing that I dislike so much about the film is this thing that we've called the idiot plot. Yeah. This movie could have been stopped at any point if anybody acted reasonably. Why doesn't she lock her door when the guy's chasing? She walks to the door, opens Leaves the door. The door open. a, an attack on California lifestyle. The California lifestyle is have eight guard dogs in your front lobby. You know? And also, the key uh, person in the plot is Vince Edwards, who plays a cop who refuses to arrest the man. He hasn't done anything wrong. He's just broken in, terrorized the woman, kid, uh, 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 eavesdropped on her, sure. sent her notes, harassed her, but the police won't arrest him. It's a cheap women in danger picture, nothing more. You're right. Our next film is Vernon, Florida, a new documentary by Errol Morris, whose last documentary was Gates of Heaven, that film about the pet <laughs> cemetery that we both liked so much last year. The new film Vernon, Florida, is set in a Florida retirement community that, based on this film, appears to be populated mostly by old people, and some of those people are different. For example, we meet a man who just loves to hunt turkeys, wild turkeys. <laughs> we pick him up here on a rural road. He's on the trail, listening, waiting. That's the cream of the hunt. From daylight to six, seven o'clock. And he's looking for a fresh track now. And if he finds a fresh track, you stop listening or go in on it. That's what he's doing, walk, walking in and listening right now. Looking for fresh sign that's cross graded roof. Where there's smoke, there's fire, you know. Find a fresh track, you know he's gobbler there. Because this is a prime area for turkey. Look how that bogged down there. Bogged an inch deep there in that dirt. He weighed 18, 20 pounds. Look at the size of the track. Look how he's bogging up that hard dirt. He probably caught across that late yesterday afternoon and roosted right back down here in these woods. And if he's got a hen with him, it's very hard to call him away from that hen. You can believe that. Anybody tell you they can call a gobbler away from a pack of hens just any time? Did you hear that? Sounds almost like a turkey gobbling, but it's not. It's one of those big woodpeckers pecking. Pooh you a lot of times. Occasionally, you'll call a big gobbler away from some hen, but very seldom. I, 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 I'd rather not even try to call one away. Well, you always try, but you can't do it. I've never have. Very, very, very seldom. Very seldom. <laughs> That's that guy, wonderful. I know, he's part Ned Beatty, and he's part one of those artesian beer commercials. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. As in that Pet Cemetery film, director Errol Morris gives us shots of people alone talking to the camera, talking about everything from God to turtles to <laughs> possums to one old gent who talks about the four parts of the human brain, which allows him, he says, to do five things at once. <laughs> the characters in this film are unforgettable. An old man holding up a possum, a police officer pointing out a bullet hole that's in the upholstery of the front seat of his car. <laughs> Big battle. And all these people have one thing in common. They have plenty of time on their hands, and so their minds have time 
to go over and over the same material, creating a labyrinth and special interests. For me, this film isn't as industrious as Gates of Heaven, isn't as memorable, but it is undeniably special. And there are parts of it I would see again right now, just that scene again. Gene, you have spoken for me. I don't know how I could improve on that. I agree with you. This is a marvelous film. Mm. You know what depresses me? You know and I know that very few people are ever going to have the chance to see Vernon, Florida. It's just not the sort of thing that exhibitors play. Right. And there are probably at this moment 1,000 or 1,500 prints of that terrible Morgan Fairchild movie right. playing all over the country, I unsuspecting know. people paying four bucks to be bored out of their minds. This man, this turkey hunter, is so human, so fascinating. Do you hear that? Mm -hmm. You know that it is just so much more. There's so much more life right. there. Absolutely. Than there is. I think that's the challenge. Uh, here we're declaring ourselves. Uh -huh. I would rather see a guy talk about turkey than than see Fairchild uh, blow away some guy. Or, I don't know about a bath, <laughs> but blowing away some guy in a, in a stupid scene like that, yeah. Okay, okay, we agree on that. Our next movie, <laughs> Ticket to Heaven, is a riveting and absolutely absorbing movie starring Nick Mancuso in a strong performance as a young man from Canada who goes down to California in search of an old friend, a friend who has joined a young people's religious cult that is never named, bears a great deal of similarity to the Moonies. In this scene, Mancuso arrives at the group's headquarters and is, a, is greeted with smiles and open arms, a cheerful invitation to dinner, it all looks terribly innocent, but it's the opening wedge of a brainwashing. David? Hi. Hello. I'm Ruthie. Carl's told me so much about you. Come on, you must be star. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> well, what do you think? What is it? <laughs> we're called the Young Pioneer Community Center. We're sort of a cooperative, except we're not. You see, it's a whole new concept. We run legal aid centers and health clinics and daycare centers, and free food giveaways and old folks' homes. Isn't that great? Who pays? Well, we have all sorts of companies to deal with that. We are 100%, 1 0 0 self supporting. All in seven years. Isn't that fantastic? A day or two later, Mancuso's indoctrination begins at the group's isolated farm. Come on, boy, come on! Let's go, David! Oh, okay, but you gotta hurry or we're gonna miss the best part. You see, we got this terrific new way of doing them. Come on, or we really are gonna miss the best part. Come on! Okay, everybody, how about a toast? Gee, they look like such nice kids. Ticket to Heaven is based on the experiences of a real cult victim, and it explains the techniques used by cults to brainwash their recruits. There seem to be three basic elements. First, they underfeed the new recruits, never giving them enough protein. Second, they systematically deprive them of sleep and surround them with songs and chants like the ones we saw in that last scene, which are designed to block individual thinking. There's no quiet for thought. And third, they use a technique called love bombing. They never let them out of sight. They constantly shower them with incessant love, support, and affection. The result is a zombie-like convert. And in this scene, Mancuso calls a friend to explain why he won't be coming home from vacation. He's found a wonderful new experience that he can't quite explain. Don't worry. I'll be right here with you. Management fees, $3,600. He says his name is David Capel. Car delivery, $2,400. Yeah, Advertising, Gentlemen, bank charge. Mr. Stone, I'm going to have to take this, okay? Okay, I'll be right back. Sorry. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Davey. Hi, what's up? You lose track of time out there? No. Look, uh, I'm not coming home right away. Uh-huh. What's her name? It's more important than that, Larry. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah? Like what? I can't describe it, really. I... Not really. You have to experience it to know what I mean. Anyway, 
I'll be staying here for a while. And... You, David, how long are you talking about? I'm not sure. Look, um, I, I gotta run now. Uh, I'll phone you in a few weeks. David, David, have you told your folks about this? They're in Florida and I lost their number. Could you, uh, no, uh, I'll call them when they get back. I gotta go now. Bye. Wait a minute. You're gonna make a wonderful heavenly child. It's remarkable the transformation Nick Mancuso undergoes in this film from a normal young man to an empty-eyed, haunted, emotionally drained robot. He's totally out of touch with what he really believes and feels. This movie is so effective, though, at communicating the sugar-coated brainwashing techniques of this group that there are actually times when the cult looks like fun, even to us. It's scary. The film's ending reflects that ambiguity, leaving it very much in doubt whether this guy is going to choose freedom or regimentation. Ticket to Heaven is one of the best movies I've seen in the last year, but it hasn't had a very good distribution around the country, and if you can find it playing anywhere near your area, I think it's worth seeing. I do, too. Um, I think that the achievement of this film is remarkable, mm -hmm. and that is, for a relatively inexpensive movie, I would think, this film is absolutely convincing in the portrayal of the cult. The mm -hmm. cult scenes mm -hmm. there seem dead on and scary. For the first time, I was able to understand how people could get involved yes. in something. I always wondered before, how do these ordinary people go off and, it, and, and get in, in you can see, You can see the groups. appeal. They form a fellowship and friendship for people. They give them very simple tasks to do. These, mm -hmm. A lot of these people are burnouts in the real world. Mm -hmm. So they sell flowers, they sell books, and it's very easy. Mm -hmm. And they put them on this mission, good mm -hmm. guy, a world, good guys, bad guys. I mean, them and us. And it's very appealing. My only fault with the film, and it's not an, a small one, is the last half. Mm -hmm. The battle for his soul is not very well done with his friends and family trying to save him and pull mm -hmm. him out. That mm -hmm. stuff's a little cornball. The first half of this film, though, is as good a horror film in a way yeah. as any I've seen. I think maybe the problem is the last part of the film involves words and ideas, and the first part of the film involves experiences that we very can really much so. identify Emotion, with. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Our next film is Missing, a fine political new thriller by Constantine Costagabras, the director of such superior political films as Z and State of Siege. Costa Gavras' main targets in his films are people and political regimes who support repression, and his targets have been located in such countries as Greece and Uruguay. This time, the location is a mythical country in South America that we know to be Chile. The story, which the film claims to be a true one, is based on the disappearance in the early 1970s of a young American man who was writing for a left-wing underground newspaper in Chile, and he disappeared only to be later found dead, apparently murdered. The film alleges that the American government was in some way responsible, allowing his death to occur with its knowledge, that our embassy officials simply allowed the young man to be taken away and shot. The film opens with that young man and a woman friend talking to another reporter about some peculiar and menacing things he's seen in his travels around the country. You know, I don't understand. There's nothing here. Now, they told us in Vina that the military were executing thousands of people here. There's nothing. When were you in Vina? We just got back yesterday. Want to hear something strange? Our hotel was full of American military officers. I'd forget about that. Are you okay? I'm all right. For God's sake, why did you do that? I don't know. Just... I don't know. Listen, both of you, forget this and forget Vina. Find yourselves a safe place, a, a hotel with lots of people around. Just hold up there until you can get out of here. The implication in that scene, of course, is that the U.S. soldiers were there to topple the government, and that, of course, that is based on real-life allegations of U.S. involvement in the fall of Salvador Allende in Chile and his replacement by the military dictatorship there. The movie Missing takes another turn after the young man disappears. His father, a successful American businessman played by Jack Lemmon, decides to fly down to the country to personally lead the search for his son. When he gets there, he meets his son's wife, Sissy Spacek, and together, they visit the U.S. Embassy to plead for help. You have all the connections. I'm a middle-aged businessman from New York City. I don't speak one word of Spanish. Here I am. My son may have been shot. 
Maybe he was tortured. Maybe he was, oh, Lord, beaten so badly that they're keeping him until he's well enough to be released. I don't know. I don't care. Oh, really, I don't care. Because what is done is done. I just want you to reach those people and tell them I will take Charles back in any condition. I'm not going to make a stink. I'm not going to go to the newspapers. You make out any kind of a release form, I will sign it. I will absolve anyone, everyone, of everything. I just want my boy back. He's the only child I have. You think that prisoner in the Not getting any satisfaction, Lemon decides to take matters into his own hands. What could Charles know that's so important? Probably what he discovered in Vigna. You say he kept notes. Uh huh. You still have them? Yeah, I do. Damn dumb thing. You do that? The making of a radical. I like Missing for a very simple reason. It does an excellent job at showing how fragile human rights are in a country that is undergoing political unrest. It can all change in an instant. Suddenly there are guns and tanks in the street, and people living in what looks to be the middle of a bad dream. And in visual terms, the street scenes in this film really do look like a nightmare. There's a great scene where one of the characters turns yeah. a corner and the street's ablaze. Missing is not a perfect film. It failed to convince me step by step of every point about the U.S. government and what it may have sanctioned. But this film unquestionably delivers at least one truth, that freedom can disappear in a flash. I'm basically in agreement. Mm -hmm. I admire the film. I recommend it. On the other hand, I think it could have been a better film, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Costa Gavras, in this film and in other films that he's made, is in love with this device of flashing back to various versions of what may or may not have happened, mm -hmm. the mystery they're trying to mm -hmm. solve. I think if this story had been told, starting with the disappearance of the husband, then the wife and the father are trying to solve the mystery, and it had been told straight through in linear terms, it would have been stronger, but the director distracts us from that human drama by cutting back to his versions of, of the mystery, of the disappearance. I think you're right. The, the narrative is powerful. Why mm -hmm. not follow mm -hmm. it straight across? I have a quibble with Jack Lemmon's performance. Sometimes there's some of his hesitation hitches in his voice that remind me of the Hollywood Lemon rather than the character of this businessman. At the same time, you know, what we know of revolution is pretty much evening news material, mm -hmm. people screaming in the streets. This film really brought it a little closer in the way somebody can, as we saw on the scene, lift it out of a restaurant. It was very interesting. I'll tell you one thing that's nice about the film. Instead of only being a political melodrama, it was interesting the way they developed that relationship between Sissy Spacek and Jack Lemmon. They're suspicious at the beginning. At the end of the film, they respect each other. That's nice. Well, now here he is, Sparky the Wonder Dog, singing a change <laughs> of pace. This week, rather than bad movies, we want to spotlight a new Academy Award category that will be coming up in this year's Oscar presentation, March 29th. The category is Best Makeup, and there are only two nominees. Roger, you go first. Well, makeup has always been one of the basic tools of the actor, and in recent years there have been amazing technological advances in the whole field, advances that have tended to blur the distinction between makeup, which is essentially any means of altering the appearance of a human actor, and special effects which create a whole new reality out of pure illusion. One of the masters of this developing field is a young man named Rick Baker, whose credits include King Kong, and who was nominated this year for his work on An American Werewolf in London. Here's an example of his work. The scars on the face of this helpless actor are makeup made with foam rubber, paints, and dyes. And this hand is makeup, but after they cut away to the actor, they cut back to a special effect, an artificial mechanical hand that stretches itself into a werewolf's paw. Mm -hmm. And here's great teamwork between makeup and special effects as actors undergo a transformation into fearsome imaginary beasts. Rick Baker's name may not be very widely known, but his werewolves certainly are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other nominee is Heartbeeps, an absolutely miserable comedy about two robots <laughs> who meet and, surprise, they fall in love. The film stars Bernadette Peters and Andy Kaufman as the pair of mechanical robots, and the only interesting thing about the movie was the makeup by Stan Winston. I want to say something that may be a little bit controversial. I don't think this category should exist. I think it's too small a specialty. Witness the fact that there are only two films apparently worthy of nomination. I think the way the Academy ought to operate is just give out a special Oscar if the makeup is extraordinary. You know, one question I have is, does the makeup have to be of werewolves or robots yeah. in order to qualify? What about ordinary makeup, like the transformation of Faye Dunaway into Joan Crawford? That was well done, too. Good point. Let's move on now to recap the main movies on this program. Two big no votes for The Seduction, starring Morgan Fairchild as a woman in danger. We both feel this movie was a sleazy exercise in voyeurism. Two yes votes, though, for Vernon, Florida, 
Errol Morris's strange and fascinating portrait of a small town eccentrics. We also agree on Ticket to Heaven, the riveting dramatic story of a young man's indoctrination by a religious cult. Two yes votes on that one. And finally, two yes votes for Missing, starring Sissy Spacek and Jack Lemmon in the dramatic tale of a missing American and the alleged cover-up by the U.S. government. We recommend that with some reservations. That's all for this week. Join us next time on Sneak Previews for more new movies, including Das Boat, a World War II adventure film about Nazi submariners, also Porky's, a teenage sex comedy, and the murder mystery Death Trap with Christopher Reeve and Michael Caine. Until then, we'll see you at the movies. Funding for sneak previews was provided by this station and by other public television stations. Mm -hmm.